How's everyone doing? This is going to be another What Didn't Make the Shelf video. And if you've seen any of these movies, definitely let me know what you think of them and let me know which one of these is your favorite because I do think there are some good movies in here, but there's some ones that I'm just not sure I'm going to rewatch again. There's 16 titles in here, right there. And some good ones, some out of print stuff. Uh, some I've got some Criterion's, Arrow Video, Twilight Time. Uh, some interesting stuff. It's an eclectic mix. My tastes are pretty eclectic. Uh, but this is just basically movies that didn't make the shelf, aka collection. Uh, I got this video series idea from Joe and Marie over at Martinez Joe 74. Definitely check out their channel. Both really nice and they have an amazing collection. And I used to do a video series like this uh, back in the day called Keeper Toss, which wasn't as good of an idea because I was basically asking your opinion and, you know, trying to rationalize keeping certain things. But if I feel like I'm thinking about getting rid of something, I should just get rid of it. So that's definitely an improvement and expect more of these videos in the future because I'm trying to thin down my collection. Uh, if you saw my recent video, I showed a complete overview. Uh, I've cut it down to under 6,000 movies now, but still, I want to cut it down to 2,500 total. And I've sold over 11,000 movies in the past five and a half years. And when you sell that many, you kind of hit an impasse, and which is where I'm at right now. And every month I get in about 30 or 40 movies. So I'm trying to get out double that each month. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna, every day I'm going to keep trying to go through the shelves and pick one or two out. Hopefully they'll you know stack up and I'll make more videos like these. But let's go ahead and get into it. First up is the Criterion Collection release for In a Lonely Place, uh, starring uh, Humphrey Bogart right here. And uh, this is directed by Nicholas Ray. I found like his story more interesting, uh, especially uh, with uh, the lead actress in here, Gloria Graham. They were married and they ended up uh, getting separated during the filming of this, but they didn't tell anybody. And uh, he said uh, that he apparently found his wife in bed with his 13 year old son. Uh, classic Hollywood was crazy. Some of the stories, like people talk about all the stories going on now, uh, it pales in comparison to classic Hollywood. Uh, yeah, so, after they got divorced, uh, Gloria Graham ended up marrying Nicholas Ray's son. And they were married for uh, a, f a long time, a fair amount of time. But that is just kind of crazy to think that that happened, just all of that. Uh, but I don't know, there's a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, I remember there's a story about him uh, apparently having a relationship with Marilyn Monroe. And then uh, her roommate then at the time, uh, Shelley Winters, and a bunch of other people... Uh, Joan Crawford, he directed uh, Johnny Guitar. Uh, he also directed Rebel Without a Cause, uh, a bunch of Flying Leathernecks, uh, a bunch of other really good films. Uh, but and this one to me, um, I don't know, I just wanted more from it. I didn't really, in I thought it was a really good performance uh, from uh, Bogey right here, but I just didn't love it overall. Uh, he's a suspect for a murder and then uh, a girl in the little um, kind of apartment complex a uh, neighbor comes and kind of offers up an alibi and there's a romance aspect and I don't know I just wanted more from the story overall it just didn't really appeal to me that much uh especially his character uh just how he turns out to be I don't know I just I didn't love it but I know this is a very beloved film it just wasn't one for me and that's fine and that's another thing too I'm not going to keep movies uh that other people like you know there's a lot of movies that are just widely beloved that I'm not a fan of uh, the two that I always talk about, the original Blair Witch Project and Paranormal Activity, for me, those are the most overhyped horror movies in history. Uh, I'm not a fan of them. I don't think they're even remotely scary. Um, and I, everybody talks about the marketing. I don't think the marketing was good either. You tell me there, you thought there was a real witch living in the woods in Maryland? If you're over the age of five, I got a bridge to sell you. Um, Paranormal Activity, there was like one jump scare at the end. It's just all that sleepwalking. I, I don't know. They're just not for me. But and that's the thing. I'm not going to, you know, care what other people think. It's about me. I feel like Movie collection should be personal. Um, so, yeah, this one really just wasn't for me. Again, I like the performance uh, from Bogey here, but the story just didn't do it for me. Uh, let me know what your favorite Humphrey Bogart movie is, your favorite Nicholas Ray movie. And uh, Nicholas Ray also worked with uh, Humphrey Bogart in uh, Knock on Any Door. Uh, he also did uh, Live by Night, another great film, not with Bogey, but that was just another one that I wanted to mention from Nicholas Ray. Uh, I think he's a very talented director, uh, and I like his uh, structure here for this film. I just didn't like the story and concept overall. Uh, next up is Letter Never Sent. Uh, this is a Russian film. Let me know what your favorite uh, Russian film is. And um, this had amazing cinematography. It's from uh, uh, Mikhail uh, Kalatazov, who did uh, the, uh, the Cranes Are Flying. 
uh, another great uh, Russian film. But for me, beautiful, breathtaking, amazing cinematography. But the story just, it was very much lacking. Uh, they were on like a diamond expedition. And it's been a while since I've seen it, but I just remember there was like uh, issues with the weather. And I remember people getting kind of lost and um, kind of like trying to survive that. They're in the Siberian wilderness. And I just remember thinking it's, you know, breathtaking, beautiful cinematography, but not much else is there. Uh, so I've had this for a while and I think it's time to let it go because I don't really see myself revisiting this one, another Criterion Collection release. They do an amazing job with their releases, you know, uh, booklets and interior artwork and the transfers and the special features, all that good stuff. So if you're a fan of these films, you'll definitely appreciate that. But again, classic Hollywood, so many crazy stories. I feel like I've, I've heard so many uh, this to me with uh, him and Gloria Graham, uh, Nicholas Ray, uh, just kind of mind blowing to think. Uh, but I digress. Let's get uh, into the uh, next few ones. We've got Halloween Kills Blu-ray. I've got an extra copy. So that's why I'm getting rid of this one. Uh, I really wasn't a big fan of this one. Uh, I thought it had some uh, great kills and gore and the score. Uh, and I like, uh, you know, the kind of throwback uh scenes in the beginning but outside of that uh, i thought it was a train wreck dumpster fire of a movie at times it seemed like kind of like a parody it seemed like the geico commercial like where uh, the slasher parody one where the like, group of kids are like uh what should we do should we go in that running car and they're like no let's go hide behind the wall of chainsaws and it's just because that's what was happening here the actions were so ridiculous and then of course evil dies tonight how many times do they need to say that and then the subplot with the other uh escapee in the hospital that whole thing could have been edited out uh, and then at the end, he becomes the Terminator. Um, and I know this has uh, the extended cut with an alternate ending. Uh, I'm going to check that one out, but I've heard it didn't add too much to it. So uh, I thought this was a huge step backwards from the previous film. I thought that one was way better. Although that one seemed to get a lot more criticism. Uh, a lot of people are saying this is one of their favorite movies in the Halloween franchise, which is mind-blowing to me. Uh, to me, it's the second worst. Um, so I don't want to see Buster. That's the only thing I can say about this one. Buster Rhymes wasn't roundhouse kicking Michael Myers. That's pretty much the only real big praise I can give this one for uh, comparison to the rest of the franchise. I'll take the Rob Zombie ones over this. I know those movies get a lot of criticism and hate. Uh, but for me, Halloween was the weakest of the big three slasher franchises. Uh, Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street. I feel like these ones had the weakest sequels. And I know that's subjective. I get a lot of criticism for saying that, but that's just my personal opinion. I feel like those other ones uh, were much more enjoyable for me, the sequels. Uh, I Season of the Witch is one of my favorite sequels for this franchise. It doesn't have Michael Myers in it. Uh, it wasn't intended, you know, it was going to be a different take where each subsequent sequel was going to have different characters and that didn't work out. And so, uh, you know, it wasn't really well received at the time. Uh, and then they brought back Michael Myers and I feel like it just kind of went downhill, uh, especially after uh, four and five, you know, just oof. Uh, but yeah, for me, this was rough. I do love the slipcover though, uh, with that embossed textured uh, feel right there. But uh, I'm going to check out the alternate ending and see if it's worth keeping in the collection because if it's not uh, a big improvement, I don't think I'm going to keep this movie in my collection. I thought it was terrible. Uh, there were some a couple good kills, some good gore here. Uh, and then the one character, uh, I always picture him as Stuart from Mad TV. Uh, but yeah, it was just a, a disaster of a movie for me. Uh, very disappointing. Uh, let me know what your favorite Halloween sequel is. Let me know what your favorite slasher franchise is. Next up uh, is uh, one archive release of uh, In Day of Wine and Roses with uh, Jack Lemmon and Lee Remick. I like Lee Remick a lot as an actress. She's very talented. And they're both really uh, great performances here. Uh, it's basically about alcoholism. He's an alcoholic and they start a romance and uh, she becomes an alcoholic and he's trying to stop and it just gets out of control. And I think it's a really good uh, look at alcoholism and how it can just ruin people's lives. Uh, and I think there's, a, there's an amazing quote in here at one point too. And there's some great scenes and great performances. But overall, I just, I don't know, I'm not that into, uh, you know, movies about alcoholism and things like that and addiction and stuff. I feel like there's a lot of them out there. Uh, and it just, it doesn't really resonate with me. Uh, I just feel like it's, it repeats so much and I've seen so many movies like this. So, um, it earned a total of five Academy Award nominations. Uh, so it did get a uh, Oscar for uh, the best song, 
uh, for uh, Henry Mancini and uh, Johnny Mercer's uh, title tune. Uh, but yeah, it's just uh, you know a look at that life and how it can just you know ruin a family. Um, they have a kid at one point too, but yeah, it starts out as you know kind of like the social drinkers, and then you know uh, San Francisco public relations uh, hotshot, and uh, you know just from there it gets out of control and uh it's just the downward spiral that takes them both under and you know at different times they're both trying to get better while the other one may not be and it's just really hard to deal with but i don't know it was great performances here but it's just not one that i i really care for uh, i feel like i've seen so many movies like that it's, they may have great performances but i just don't love that story and that concept and i'm just i don't know i've seen too many movies like that uh, let me know what your favorite movie dealing with uh, alcoholism and addiction is. Next up is Marvin's Room. This is the outer print release, although there are other releases. It's interesting to me that um, this one like still goes for like 35 bucks or so, uh, even though it's a re-release that goes for, I want to say like 15 or something. Uh, it's got that first time on Blu-ray logo. It's from Echo Bridge. Uh, a lot of those ones are, you know, kind of pricey now. But uh, Marvin's Room, Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, Meryl Streep, Diane Keaton, Robert De Niro in here, great cast. I'd really love to see This Boy's Life get a, a Blu-ray release with uh, Robert De Niro and Leonardo DiCaprio. I don't really hear enough people talking about that one, but that was a really good film. Um, this one to me had a lot of like family drama and good performances here and just, you know, the different relationships there, um, kind of a homecoming and uh, turns everything upside down with their family. Uh, but... I don't, I just didn't love the film overall. You know, he's a rebellious kid and uh, just clashing with family members. And uh, it was a good performance for a young Leo, uh, but I don't love the film and I don't really see myself rewatching it. So uh, I do think he's a tremendous actor. Let me know what your favorite uh, Leonardo DiCaprio movie is. And I definitely think he deserved more Oscars. Uh, next up, uh, I've got a few Twilight Time releases. Um, this one's limited to 3,000 copies. I really love this company. Uh, they kind of went under, but then Screen Archives picked them up and they released a few movies since then, but not quite as many as they used to. And this is the fabulous Baker Boys. And uh, I think this was predominantly shot around uh, Seattle, it takes place there. And you uh, definitely get that feel of it. And this is now a print title and it goes for a decent amount of money, around a hundred bucks. Uh, consistently actually selling. I think the last time I looked, it was going, the last couple ones were like 90, 115, 120, around that range. And I think all the ones that are currently on uh, eBay are a uh, hundred plus. Uh, so, you know, uh, I feel like I've had this sitting for a while. I think I'd rather have the money to get way more movies uh, or other stuff that I might need uh, than just having this movie sit for years without watching it again or ever watching it again. I do like the actors involved here, the the trio. And this is from uh, the 80s and I feel like they were great in uh, several different decades, uh, especially, uh, you know, Jeff Bridges and Michelle Pfeiffer. Michelle Pfeiffer, I feel like she was really great in the 80s, uh, but she also did a lot of great things in the 90s too. I think of, you know, certain movies especially for her you know dangerous minds but also you know grease 2 uh lady hawk uh, scarface of course uh witches of eastwick uh, uh frankie and johnny another one with uh, al pacino and uh batman returns she was iconic as Catwoman. uh so many married to the mob so many great wolf uh, another one i uh, really love that one and uh and one that i think is kind of underrated is what lies beneath uh, that deserves more love. It recently got a Blu-ray release, but she is a tremendous actress. Let me know what your favorite Michelle Pfeiffer movie is. Let me know what your favorite Jeff Bridges movie is. And if you have a favorite Bo Bridges movie, let me know. And uh, it's just basically about these two brothers, obviously real life brothers right here uh, with uh, Bo Bridges and Jeff Bridges. And then you have Michelle Pfeiffer and uh, they're, you know, uh, doing, uh, you know, kind of like jazz performance. They're pianists and lounge and they're trying to uh, spruce up their act a bit. And they have Michelle Pfeiffer in there. And of course, there's a romance aspect and the brothers clash. Uh, so I remember not, I remember thinking it was okay, but I didn't love it. Um, I liked uh, the actors, but I didn't really love the film overall. Uh, but it is a nice release for the film. And I do again, I, that's one of the, like, there's little things about Twilight Time that I really appreciate, like how all the technical aspects are boxed off. Like a lot of times it's hard to find the year something was made, the runtime, stuff like that. And I'm always looking for that. Sometimes the print is so minute, but not here. It's so easily accessible. And again, you get uh, interior artwork, booklets. Um, always love them as a company. Felt like they were really underrated. 
Next up is Summer Lovers. And this again is another out of print title from Twilight Time. It used to go for like 90 bucks, but now it's going for around like 30, 35. So I kind of missed the opportunity to make a little bit more money off of there. I was keeping it on the shelf. I was like, oh, I do like this one. It's got some, you know, sensuality, you know, really wonderfully shot. Uh, I like the actors involved here, especially Daryl Hannah and uh, Peter Gallagher. Uh, and I didn't see too much from Valerie Quinesson before, but I do like her in here. But I, you know, I was just kind of keeping it in there. But I was like, I, I've had it for years. I only watched it the one time. So uh, maybe I should have gotten rid of it when it was uh, more of a hotter ticket item. But a lot of these ones uh, for the Twilight Time uh, would go for crazy amounts of money. Uh, I really liked this film, but it's just not one I'm sure I'm going to revisit too much. Uh, this is a follow-up from uh, Randall Kleiser's uh, Blue Lagoon, and uh, it's set on a Greek island. This couple, they go there, and they basically start hooking up with another woman there. They bring them into their, you know, little bungalow, and, you know, there's different romance aspects. At first, the one girl's a little bit jealous, and then she's into it, and then she ends up getting into another relationship and there's some like there's a crazy scene where they're like pouring like uh you know oil like vegetable oil on each other like cooking oil and there's just like some crazy scenes in here uh, i've got peter gallagher daryl hannah who by the way is apparently married now to neil young found that out recently they've been married for a few years and then uh valerie uh quinnesson uh but yeah it beautiful looking landscape for uh greece right here and uh you get that really vacation, uh, hedonistic vibe throughout. Uh, very sensual film, but it's not one that I feel like I'm going to, you know, rush to rewatch. So uh, this is, again, another one that I think is really, you know, a good film. But, uh, you know, if I'm not going to rewatch it, it's time to get it out of here. Space is at a premium, and I don't want to keep things just to keep them. And realistically, how many movies can we rewatch in our lifetime? And next up, I've got uh, Venom. Venom. And you guessed it, Venom. I've got two sealed copies and an open copy, and I have another copy as well uh, for me. Uh, this is another Twilight Time release, one of their newer ones, and this is from 1971. This is a really weird film. Um, I, don't, I like to give uh, what they release a chance because they've offered so many films that I think were amazing. Uh, so I like to check out anything that they release. Uh, this is uh, set in uh, like a small German village in uh, Bavarian countryside. Um, I remember they were speaking German there. I lived in Germany for four and a half years as a kid in uh, Frankfurt. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Uh, unfortunately, I don't remember too much of the language. I didn't retain it when I moved back to the States. Nobody spoke it, so. Uh, but I would like to go back, you know, maybe for Oktoberfest or something like that. I was too young at the time. Um, but there's basically the story of this woman, this girl right here living in the woods who, you know, kills any guy that she comes in contact with. And it's like this local lore and there's a photography uh, guy a photographer there who comes to the village just by happenstance and they think he's like somebody else and they're trying to essentially kill him and there's uh you know the story of this venomous uh spider that can kill people uh and uh it has like a white cross on its back and you find out more about uh the story and the town and the people involved uh, and there's, you know, some romance aspects here, kind of like a, uh, trust situation. And it was a weird, and then towards the end, there's like, almost like a psycho-esque moment. Uh, it gets a little goofy and the acting isn't great. Uh, this one was, I would say below average. I was disappointed in this one. Probably my least favorite Twilight Time movie that I've seen, uh, for film, you know, film that they've released through their label. Uh, but, uh, another limited edition one. And these ones go for, I think about 38 bucks. So... You know, I've been, people ask me, why do you get movies that you already have? Uh, a lot of times I'll get them from, you know, uh, sellers that are uh, sometimes local sellers that have lots of movies. And if I can get them for a really good price, I can you know pick them up to uh, trade them, trade bait, or to resell them. So I feel like a lot of people on here do the, the resale thing. They'll go out thrifting and stuff like that. Uh, I don't watch a lot of those channels that do, you know, the thr thrifting stuff because I feel like it's really no focus on the actual movies. I want to at least talk about the movie somewhat. Uh, that's what I'm here for. But um uh, I know those movies or those videos are real popular, but yeah, for me again, uh, if I, if I have a chance to, you know, make some money off of it and it's a good, something good like that, or, you know, trade bait, I'll pick it up. If, even if it's a lot that has like duplicates to me, it's worth it. Uh, next up again, I have uh, duplicates of, uh, we of the never, never. And I've got another copy for myself, both brand new, still sealed. I want to say these ones go for like 25 each. Uh, but this is an Australian film. It's set during uh, 1902, uh, romance 
and dealing with like misogyny at the time, you know, living in a man's world, it's no place for a woman in Australia right there, like the outback area. Uh, and so they have great cinematography and, you know, they have the aboriginals there and she's, you know, talking to them, trying to learn about them. Uh, I've always been fascinated by uh, the Australian outback, uh, especially. I love uh, finding, you know, the especially movies to deal with like thrillers and horror and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm definitely excited to check this one out. This is another limited release. This is from 1982. Uh, next up is Seven Deaths in the Cat's Eyes, another limited edition release. Uh, I have another copy of this somewhere in this mess of a collection. You see there are two bookcases behind me. I've got 13 total bookcases and piles all around me in front of me. So I do have another copy of this one. Uh, and this is from... Um, uh, it's Anthony M. Dawson is credited, but it's really uh, Antonio Margaretti. I uh, was done a lot of, uh, you know, horror and giallo, uh, style films. And this is another one that looks to be in that same vein. Uh, it's basically about this aristocratic family that gathers in an ancestral Scottish castle. And it says there's a razor wielding murderer, uh, as an unwelcome guest. Uh, to me, it sounds like a bunch of other movies, uh, that I've, uh, seen before with that style with, uh, you know, a bunch of people, family members or, uh, just, you know, people that know each other in a, you know, house and somebody's killing them off one by one. That's what it, you know, sounds like to me. I haven't checked this one out yet myself. And it says there's a pet gorilla, an omnipresent ginger tabby, uh, and there's all kinds of craziness going on here, unnatural deaths and uh, the, the cursed history and uh, all it sounds super wild. And uh, I'm definitely looking forward to checking it out. Uh, singer actress Jane Birkin plays the the willowy heroine here uh, who foreshadows several unnatural deaths so uh, I'm definitely looking forward to this one checking out myself but I do have a duplicate of it so time to get rid of that one obviously uh, next up I have uh, a couple uh, three arrow titles to finish this off arrow video does an amazing job releasing as well these are like some of my favorite companies releasing criterion collection arrow video and twilight time just because i love the company doesn't mean i'm going to keep every release i know a lot of people collect every single thing from like scream factory arrow video criterion collection twilight time stuff like that if it's a movie i don't like or a movie i don't see myself re-watching again even if i think it's a good movie it's time to get rid of it uh i don't i don't know I, I i that's not how i collect personally so uh django prepare a coffin uh i remember liking aspects about this film but thinking it was so convoluted uh, from the one scene where he gets shot so many different times and then he comes back, it's a revenge tale. And, uh, you know, it's a, a B-movie Western. Uh, I do like Westerns a lot. I didn't like them growing up as a kid, but now they've become my third favorite genre, horror, sci-fi, and now Westerns. Uh, let me know what your favorite Western movie is. I do like, um, you know, Django, uh, the character here. This one, uh, like Django is played by uh, Terrence Hill. Uh, let me know what your favorite uh, spaghetti western is too. But the 60s spaghetti western right here that I thought was good but not great. Again, uh, some really convoluted aspects that I couldn't look past for me. But a really nice release. Um, swing tray, booklet, interior, uh, reversible artwork. That's another thing I like about Arrow Video, the reversible artwork aspect. Uh, next up is uh, The Suspicious Death of a Minor from uh, Sergio Martino, uh, which I actually really do like this film, but I recently got the Sergio Martino box set from Arrow Video, uh, which has this movie in it, so that's the only reason I'm getting rid of it. Uh, there's a detective uh, basically uh, trying to uh, solve the case of this murdered uh, underage prostitute, and then there's a killer for hire trying to kind of like wipe people out to uh, stop him from getting to the bottom of the case. Let me know what your favorite uh, Giallo film is as well, speaking of, you know, this one and then uh, Seven Deaths in a Cat's Eyes. Uh, let me know what your favorite Australian movie is. That's a good one. Give me some good Australian movie recommendations for me to check out, especially like murder, mystery, thriller, horror stuff. Uh, I feel like they have so many amazing horror movies. Definitely let me know what your favorite Australian horror movie, that one, horror movie is. Uh, I feel like there's a bunch of ones that still need a U.S. Blu-ray release. Uh, Hounds of Love actually has a Blu-ray release. Uh, I think it might be a BDR, but definitely worth checking out. Very underrated. Uh, and then um, The Loved Ones definitely needs a Blu-ray release here in the U.S. Uh, Storm Warning and Wolf Creek are two other ones that I think uh, need Blu-ray releases here in the U.S. Storm Warning is super underrated. Uh, but Suspicious Death of a Minor, uh, I definitely enjoy this one. Again, another really good Arrow video release, booklet, reversible artwork. So... I'm only getting rid of this one because I have the box set which already contains this. That was a recent release, so I had this previously. Next up is Threshold with the slipcover. I like that they're doing slipcovers sometimes now as well. 
Uh, and again, they do such an amazing job, complete uh, releases for physical media fans. One of the best companies releasing Arrow Video, again, Criterion. Uh, Twilight Time, they're coming back, but uh, uh, I think my top two would probably be Criterion Collection, Arrow Video. Uh, Arrow Video does a lot more horror and cult titles and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, their special features, the transfer uh, the packaging, you know, clear cases, reversible artwork, booklet, disc artwork, the whole nine. Uh, so, yeah, this one is dealing with a brother-sister, and the sister has addiction issues, and there's like a cult involved, and the brother's not sure if it's, you know, her addiction issues speaking, or there's an actual cult involved. And I remember thinking, like, the lead actress is really attractive, but I shouldn't like her, because, you know, the character she's playing, the role she's, you know, dealing with withdrawals and stuff like that, and just kind of real messy. I was like, ah, I should reevaluate my, uh, my attraction to this. <laughs> Uh, but it was an interesting film. Uh, I like one part uh, towards the end especially, but I feel like it just kind of falls flat overall. It doesn't fully come to fruition. Um, I feel like I would like to see this redone, but, in a, you know, obviously I feel like it had the potential to be much better than it was. Uh, so yeah, they're, you know, kind of comparing it to Kill List and other movies like that, cult movies, and it's nowhere near that level. Kill List was actually a really good cult movie uh, dealing with cults and stuff like that, but Threshold to me just kind of falls flat. It misses the mark. Uh, but you know, the lead actress, I was there for her. <laughs> I kept watching for her. And, uh, again, I liked the uh, part towards the end of the movie, but I feel like, uh, it was rough to sit through a lot of it. Uh, so there you go. Those are the 16 titles. If you've seen any of them, definitely let me know what you think of them and let me know which one of these is your favorite as well. And I uh, look forward to more of these videos of what didn't make the shelf coming up soon. Cause I really do want to cut the collection in half and then some, uh, so hope everybody's doing well. Take care.